Okay. Let's see if that's loud enough. <laughs> Howdy partners, welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski and today we're going to be looking at the art of another one of my very favorite artists and doing our darndest to make a version of inspired by one of these great artworks and today's artist is Charles M Russell or Charles Marion Russell or Charlie Russell or the kid or the kid Russell or Charlie the kid lots of different names for what is probably most popularly known as the cowboy artist so Let's dive right into it, as usual. Got lots of stuff to do and to show you. And uh, it is hot down here, which is one of the things that our artist today would have been very used to. And look at me, I'm out of focus. I forgot to focus that camera. So, how about let's put this on the screen, and then I'll go run around and focus the camera. So... Here's the painting that we're going to make today. Come on. It's called A Bad One. And let me just go adjust the focus. How did that get all twisted up? Huh. Now, there we go. Okay, so today uh, the painting we're going to make is from 1912. It's called A Bad One. And um, it's, it's a little bit more of one of the more obscure paintings of this great artist's oeuvre. Um, but it's um, because I think most of Charlie Russell's paintings tend towards a little bit more of the complex spectrum of things and it's that doesn't mostly because what we're painting today is a person riding a horse and you know just like when we do any kind of figurative work or a portrait uh it tends to take a little bit more um a little bit more precision although one of the things that's interesting about uh charles m russell or charlie russell is let's just call him Charlie from from now on, right? Uh, one thing that's interesting about Charlie is is the facility he has about being able to draw people and animals very quickly. Now, this is an introduction to painting class, so for beginners and intermediate artists. So, what might have come very easy to Charlie might be a little bit more on the challenging side for the beginners. So that's why we're just going to focus on one figure. And uh, I think that should be more than enough for, for, for all of us. And I love this image, too, by the way. Um, so let's get into the image and the history of this great artist. Um, oh, actually, you know, before I even mention that, I'll let you know that I've done an outline for today's episode. An outline which you can print off, and I'm going to show you how to transfer this onto a canvas, because I haven't had a chance to do that yet. So if you want to transfer this image onto your canvas... There's a link below for a Dropbox folder or folders, and you'll see all the different artists that we've covered so far. Uh, we've been going all the way around the world looking at art from every country. Uh, well, that's the goal. I want to have at least one painting from every single country on Earth um, and every every major um art movement etc and so if we keep on where are we so last week we did a whole week on tom thompson and today here we are at charles m russell and what we're doing this week is we're celebrating uh the calgary stampede now i'm born and raised in calgary alberta and uh, for those of you who aren't aware the calgary stampede is quote unquote the greatest outdoor show on earth which is um it's uh, at its origin, maybe we'll take a look at a, a few pictures here, was a, uh, was a celebration of Western culture. Western 
North American culture, or even more precisely, like ranching and cowboy culture. Although, just for as a caveat, cowboys and ranchers <laughs> do not get along, right? But uh, but essentially, really, it's a, a, a ten days where people walk around in cowboy hats and cowboy boots, uh, even if they've never worn one ever before. It's a little bit of an opportunity for the city folk to dress up um, and pretend that they're a little bit on the on the uh, the wild west. Okay, so we go look into the Charles M. Russell folder. You're going to see that there are six files in here, um, but there's only really two paintings. So we've got two versions of the outline. One's a JPEG and one's a PDF. We have the original painting itself. And then I've also included, this is what I was originally planning on doing. Um, it's another buck and bronco, another uh, uh, horse being ridden. You know, it's a, a wild horse trying to buck its uh, rider. The reason why, and I also did an outline, there's two outlines, a JPEG and a PDF. Um, the reason why I chose this one is it's a, it's a more of a side view, and that might be just a little bit easier for some folks. Um, doing a, This is more of a what we call a three-quarter point of view, so you have something straight on, right? I'm straight on. This is your profile. You see me half, you know, from the side. And then this is your three-quarter point of view, right? So it's, you know, three-quarters um, three quarters of the way, I guess, all the way back. Or if we were here, it's three-quarters of the way to here, I guess. And I, all of a sudden thinking, like, what does that mean, three-quarters? Um, but uh, I just thought this might be a little bit more straightforward for, for people. Okay. So let's take a quick look here again. I want to let you know that there's a private Facebook group just for people that are, are painting along with me. There is an excellent PBS documentary on Charlie Russell that you can watch. There's the first hour, I think, that I've linked below here. I've, here in Canada, I'm, I wasn't able to watch this PBS documentary because it's, you know, the internet blocked things off. But I, if you want to watch the first hour of, I think it's a three-hour documentary, you can if you're outside if you're in the United States this you should be able to access this there's a link for it it's there's a bunch of links down below and you can find that if you can't um, again you can click on the link it's it's a Facebook video from uh, PBS Mo or Montana PBS or whatever and great documentary and uh, uh, so let's let's kind of just take a look at some of Charlie Russell's paintings um, oh, C.M. Russell. Did I say that? That's another way that he's been referred to. Lots of nicknames, which isn't uncommon for cowboys. Um, oft, you know, they're kind of like hockey players or, or lots of athletes. They tend to pick up lots of funny nicknames from friends along the way. And sometimes they're nicknames they've given to themselves to make themselves appear... Um, more one thing or another. And in this case, Charles M. Russell, Charlie Russell, was a pretty authentically Western guy. He was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, and I think at the age of 16 took a train out to Montana. And we're talking like 1880, early 1880s anyway, and at that time, Montana would have been, you know, on the fringes of the Western expansion of the United States. Yes, there were, you know, lots of people living in San Francisco. The Gold Rush had happened in 1849. So California was fairly well, you know, established. But there's a sort of gap between, you know, uh, St. Louis, which would have, you know, if you've seen the arch in St. Louis, right, that's... The kind of the, the the archway to the west, right? And it's, it's where Lewis and Clark uh, began their western adventure um, to map out the western United States, which had been newly acquired. That's a whole other kind of thing. Um, but um, it would have been a fairly... He, ba ba one thing that's really interesting about Charlie Russell is that he, he sort of... He, goes to Montana 
precisely at the time where um, the the, the so-called Wild West comes to an end, right? He's, he's there for maybe two, three years before the ranchers come in, before barbed wire fences start dividing all of this wild, endless expanse of un, quote-unquote untamed land. And so he worked as a, as a cowboy, as a, as a um, horse rustler, Horse, horse rustler, <laughs> um, kind of helping to. Um, d he participated in the in this large uh, resettlement of buffalo from the, the United from Montana up into Canada to help preserve them before they became because they were on the danger they were in danger of being extinct. Anyway, so he finds a job at the age of sixteen working as as a cowboy. And while he, during his off time, he's, he's sketching. He's a self-taught artist, and he's drawing. You know, he's got a little sketchbook. He's got all these like pencils and paintbrushes in a sock that he carries around in his backpack. You know, cowboys. You know, they they don't have a lot of. They basically carry everything they need on their backpack and on their saddle, right? So he. It, he sort of taught himself how to draw just by looking at the animals and the people around him during his off time. And so he was a great observer. Um, so we're just looking at some of his artworks along the way here. Oh, 270. I didn't realize there's that many here. Let's, oh, oops. Let's bring that back. Last closed tab. So here's... <laughs> Here's him with his cowboy hat, which he often wore all of the time, and it became kind of like Bob Ross, that big wild hair, his signature, right? He he spent a good part of his time, tra he would travel back and forth to New York, and he would, you know, walking around New York City in his cowboy hat and cowboy boots, he looked very authentic, like a man out of time uh, while he was there. Uh, let me... I just want to show. So this was a painting I contemplated painting today. I decided against it just because it was a, it's a little bit more complex. But I do love this painting, um, and this might be, according to some people, his most famous and maybe most iconic painting. I think maybe later on at some point I'm going to do this painting. But um, anyway, let's. Uh, um, Let's get right into to the to the painting because we want to get this one um, started as quickly as possible here, right? So here's the the the, uh, the actual artwork, a bad one, and it is at the Sir Richardson Museum. Which, uh, to be honest, where is the Sir Richardson Museum? Um, in Fort Worth, Texas, it looks like a Fort Worth Art Museum. And I think this one is a smaller museum, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, it's not one of the gigantic major museums around the, you know, like the Metropolitan. So what's great about those small museums, which I strongly encourage you to check out. If you ever, you know, have an opportunity to go to some of the small museums around the world, they're often some of the most interesting ones because they might only have... 30 paintings up on the wall and you can really look at them if you've ever been to the metropolitan or the national gallery in canada or london england or washington dc just jammed full of stuff everywhere and after you know you can spend literally two or three solid days just walking through them and not see everything right and it's just it's my brain gets fried when i go to those um uh, anyway, so here, this is the Charlie Russell documentary. What do I want to say? We'll talk about Philip Goodwin here. Um, yeah, so let's get right into the painting. And I'll talk about this book, which is uh, chronicling the, the, the two visits that Charlie Russell had to Calgary, where he exhibited his work at the Calgary Stampede which were very important to his career and to helping establish him as 
uh, both an authority of Western culture and um, and obviously as a great artist, but also really helped establish the Stampede as a, uh, a major event for um, the celebration of Western culture. Okay. So, uh, I took all my art supplies out here. Let's look at this painting, and we're going to get it started. Now, I haven't had a chance to outline this image. Usually I try to do that beforehand. And one one thing I think is kind of interesting is for whatever reason my photo my my printer spatted out of the printer on a bit of an angle. I don't know if you could see you see the it's crooked. So this is actually kind of useful because now we can just I can just show you how to how we level these things out because it might be nice to have a level horizon. So, let's take a look here. Let's say, I'm gonna, you know, let's go on this side here. Actually, let's just draw a line straight through here, I think. I think that's a straight, that's, yeah, that makes sense, okay. So then, let's say, I'm just going to make an arbitrary, or let's go down. I think there might be a little bit nicer, if you make that sky kind of nice, so. Nine and a half inches. Let's put that up just a bit. Okay, that's close enough. I think I think this other side is yeah, that's good. So I'm going to transfer it using my carbon paper. You can get the carbon paper at your art supply store. There's a link to an Amazon link in the description if you want to use that. You can also get it from your art supply store. I, I'm not surprised that today is one of the more quiet episodes. There's fewer people watching live, at least. Um, I know that uh, around Canada, the Calgary Stampede is a bit controversial. And... Um, and I totally understand... <laughs> Listen, I'm from Calgary, born and raised in Calgary, and I went to art school in Calgary. And when I was there, when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, the Calgary Stampede was a lot of fun, and it was super cool. You know, there's there's um, a midway where you can ride around on the rides, and haunted houses, and roller coasters, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then as I got older... I went to art school, um, I found it to be, uh, you know, a, a, this, a lot of people just dressing up and getting drunk and getting in fights at bars and, um, it, you know, just basically Calgary turns into a 10 day New Year's Eve party. Which, for some people, is awesome. Um, but for me personally, uh, that was uh, not a desirable kind of place to, to be. And, um, and I also, 
you know, it, when you're in art school, like the stampede sort of represents everything that your, or at least me and my friends um, were not. Uh, it didn't really mesh with my values, I guess. And it just seemed like a bunch of businessmen who wanted to let loose and, and dress up like Halloween for a while. Um, and, you know, it wasn't actually until many years later, probably what would have been about 10 years ago, where I was invited by the Calgary Stampede to participate in a program where they took contemporary artists who didn't do, who had no connection to Western art whatsoever, who were modern um, artists, I guess, uh, not Western artists, because there is a whole genre of Western art, of which Charles M. Russell, Charlie Russell, is essentially the founder of. And, uh, and part of that program, I got to spend, uh, I think it was like four days on a, on a historic ranch. And it was the descendants of what is now referred to as the, the Big Four in Calgary. The Big Four were four ranchers who got together to uh, fund the very first stampede. And so I got to spend four days hanging out with, on a ranch with, uh, with one of these ranchers. This guy whose property, you know, him and I, you know, riding around on horses, looking out on the horizon, and I said to him, you know, where, where's like the edge of the property here? Like, how, how big is, is your ranch? And he's like, well... Okay, he's pointing over towards the mountains. He's okay, you see right before the mountains, there's like a hill, right? Okay, just over that hill is the western edge of the of the property. And you're like, like I, I mean, I don't know how that's maybe a hundred kilometers, right? Or how many? That's how many miles? I, you know, maybe sixty miles. Like, and then go the other way, and then. Pfft, so I was just like, wow, that, we're talking a vast expanse. But what I thought was cool is that this fellow, you know, his family, you know, is, owns a good portion of the province. And yet he wakes up at four in the morning and goes and feeds the horses and rides. You know, I was just like, oh, that's actually, you know, I, I got to say, there's a lot of people who've got money who, who decide not to spend their time in that particular way so there it's it's kind of cool to see that uh he's carrying on the the traditions and the culture of his uh of his ancestors essentially right his great great uh grandparents okay so i got this image transferred onto the canvas And, you know, once you've got this transferred, I save all of these and I give them to our daughter to draw on. Um, so, um, oh, I, I was going to sand the canvas. I have my sandpaper. Usually what I do is give it a bit of a sand before we start drawing on it, but I forgot to do that. So, uh, probably because I didn't have a sip of my tea yet. Okay, now the question here, if we're going to look at this painting, is, you know, how we're going to, how we're actually going to go about making this painting. So, I think what I'm going to do, I'm just going to do my regular coat of yellow and then we'll we'll do another one with um, a bit more white in it so yeah that's probably good enough Oops. so put a bit of my warm yellow onto the canvas most people who are watching me are brand new to the show so 
If you're wondering what color this is, there's links to a whole 45 episodes long how to paint course. You don't, you're certainly encouraged to, to follow every episode, but really it's the first few where we talk all about the colors and I suggest different colors that uh, would be good for you to purchase um, so that both you can paint along with me, but to make any kind of painting essentially. Um, but here we're using our warm yellow as a foundational color. He probably would not have used a color quite as bright of, as this for his paintings. Although what is really interesting, and I didn't know this, this is in that PBS documentary, is that, you know, he's, again, he's a self-taught artist, which is really a remarkable, right? And he... Um, when he goes to New York, he, you know, I, I would have been around, or just around this time, right, maybe a few years before that, I think it was like 1904, right, so I guess well, 12 years before this, so not right around that time, but, um, this period of time, kind of in the early, the turn of the century, is really important for his development because he goes to New York and he he makes some money selling his work there and I think light bulbs go off and he's just like wow people really are into this art in New York City of all places right but I think what he realizes really quickly is is that, that there's a public fascination with the the West and he was there, he saw the quote-unquote real Wild West, and he saw it dissolve and disappear. He, um, there's, there's lots of interesting, interesting discussion we can have about his relationship to indigenous people, or so-called American Indians. And um, uh, he, he saw them... Uh, being pushed out of out of their ancestral territories and lands, he saw them being hunted down and murdered, and he saw them uh, dying from disease. So he he's one of the few kind of white people at that time to to be a, an ally as much as possible, at, especially at that time, to the plight of the American Indian. Again, here in Canada, Indian is a bit of an offensive term, so I'll just use indigenous persons as because uh, that's how we uh, refer to uh, people who who the First Nations, the people that were here before the white settlers. Who um, like here, I'm uh, a guest on unceded territory here in Vancouver. Anyway, so he saw the the transformation of of this of the li the lives of the indigenous people that had been there for forty thousand years. Remember, there were people living like here in Vancouver and in Montana for forty thousand years prior to white people coming to this land, right? And to give you a little bit of a, a, a put that into perspective. The pyramids of Egypt were built 3,000 years ago, right? So 37,000 years before that, there were people living um, in this area, the area where I am and in the area there that Charles M. Russell was um, uh, essentially made his career. And so he was there at the very end and he saw this, this great proud culture essentially uh, almost entirely vanish from the earth right it's, um for all for because of very a number of very um disturbing reasons um but uh he there was when he went out to new york he saw the the power of the nostalgia that people had for this um this part of american history and canadian history and that people, um, people wanted to have a little bit of that. Remember, this is also at a time where 
Um, Wild Bill Hickok had his um, touring sort of extravaganza circus where they would go around and and reenact famous gunfights and stuff in Madison Square Garden. And then you have Charles... Well, Charles M. Russell's a little bit before... Well, around actually about the same time. Um, and he's just immediately like... Like, some lights go off. Like, oh, you, you think if I keep making these paintings, I'm going to keep selling them, not just to to my friends, my cowboy friends back in Montana and rancher friends, but to businessmen and lawyers and whatever else in New York City and Chicago, Toronto, Montreal, etc. Okay, I'm still almost dry. I'm sorry. I like telling stories, but I also I try to tell those stories while the paint is drying. <laughs> So if we look at the original, we have this sky that's good. That's um, both the sky and the ground um, are are muted. There's a, there's some there's lots of white in 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 almost every aspect of this painting. As I'm looking at it, really the only place where we see a bright color is on is like right there. Right, we have a, a warm red here. We got a bit of a cool red here, magenta, and then everything else has been tinted with white. Right, when we add white to a color, we call that tinting. Right, when we add gray to a color, we call that um, <laughs> we call that uh. uh why well, I'm just all of a sudden blanking. We add when we add black to a color, we add shade. Um, what does we call when we add gray to a color? Why does that suddenly escape my mind? Anyway, uh, it's not important because I'm not really going to be doing too much of that in today's painting. So I think what I want to do next is, um, and I did a whole episode on value see the, I need to go back and watch my own courses because I, I clearly forgot um, anyway so we're gonna mix a color for the background and for the foreground and so let's start putting some paint on our palette so I'm gonna put some warm yellow here in my on my palette here some cool yellow you know I, I give um, Charlie Russell a lot of credit for being a very humble person in the sense that you know he, he started painting and he didn't really know necessarily what he was doing and he sought people out who could help him, who could mentor him. And uh, the Philip Goodwin, there was a link I was going, I was kind of teasing earlier, was one such artist who really had a profound impact on um, Charlie. And it's it's kind of sad that that Philip Goodwin uh, has sort of, I mean, you can find images of his work online. But uh, he's now a much more obscure figure. Um, but Philip Goodwin, you know, came and visited Charlie Russell because I think people thought like, like Charlie Russell, he established, he built like, he started selling his paintings and he built uh, like a cabin in Montana. I think around like 1906, I think is when he built his cabin. And Philip Goodwin came and visited him watched him paint and and gave him lots of advice 
And it's interesting when we think about this and Tom Thompson, who we looked at last week, a very similar thing happened with Tom Thompson. Tom Thompson did take a small number of classes. How many? We're not sure. Um, but he was fortunate enough to become good friends with all of the guys who became the Group of Seven, all of which had attended art school at one time or another. And like Charlie Russell, Tom Thompson soaked up as much information from these other artists as possible, and it really revolutionized their art. Anyway, one of the things that, among among the dozens of things I'm sure he learned, was really color. Well, there's two things. You could say color and the, the making his paintings more dramatic. Um, really trying to find scenes where there was some kind of story or narrative that could be created out of it. Okay. Tone. Thank you, Murray. <laughs> See, I know this is... I was, I, it's immediately after I said it, you know, I should have just... Next time I forget something, I'm just going to pretend it's a question for people paying attention. <laughs> Do you know... Like, Yeah. So thank you very much, Murray. Um, yeah, when we add gray to a color, we're adding tone, or we're changing the tone of a color. When we add white to a color, we're tinting the color... Uh, and when we add black to a color, we're throwing shade. That's the way I always think of it. Black, you're throwing shade, right? Like a um, RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> okay, so for let's take a let's put these side by side. Oops, that's not what we want. Um. So let's mix our background. So what I'm going to do is, uh, for the background here behind the cowboy here, we want a bit of a cooler yellow. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to mix two browns. We're going to mix a warm brown for the foreground, and we're going to mix a cool brown for the background. Okay? So to start out, let's take some cool yellow. We'll get our brush filler. We're probably going to use all of this yellow. But... Uh, and then we're going to take some cool blue. We're not going to need too much of it. And we're going to take some cool red. Maybe a little bit more of that. Right, and you see when we mix them up onto the side here, we get this uh, kind of reddish color. So what I have to do is take that and then I mix it in here. we get this color. And I think it might be just instructive. This is really the first opportunity I've had to do this. So let's, we've got our cooler brown. Let's do the same thing because for the, uh, with our, to make a warm brown, just so you can see the difference here. So let's take a bit of warm red and a bit of warm blue. So I, I'm, it's a little bit hard to get the exact consistencies here, but I think that's pretty close, right? We've got our warm brown here, which has a much more orangey quality, right? And then we've got our cool brown here, which has a bit more of, um, of a greenish kind of quality. So you're like, green, I just see brown. I, I can understand... Um, why it can be kind of confusing to people but um we can also see this if we start adding white to it that one's gonna they're both gonna kind of cool a little bit but the cool is gonna cool more <laughs> okay so let's take um some white and 
And you can see right there, we're pretty darn close to the color we want, right? We just get this in here. You see? And this is also just as a reminder, you can see that he's using, he's applying these laws of color theory that I've been teaching for, <laughs> forever here, right? So he's, he's made a cool yellow that goes in the background. Um, I think I'm gonna need a little bit more of this to cover that whole background. So let's just kind of steal a little bit more of that color. We're gonna put a bit more yellow in here. dark so I'll add a bit more white to it I do have this big brush so that big brush is also soaking up a lot of this paint into the bristles again if we want to just take a quick look we're pretty close so maybe add a little bit more cool red in here Okay, so let's start by painting that color into our background. Actually, how about let's just turn this. Like, personally, I find that kind of stuff, like just what we just did, really fascinating. Or at least, I, especially when I was beginning to paint, like the stuff we're, I'm just showing you is stuff that um, I kind of had to do myself. I had to kind of look up this information on my own. So, yeah, it's a little bit on the darker side, but maybe we'll do another coat anyway. We'll see. I think I'll have to do another coat. And so the second coat, we'll just put more white in here. See, I'm still using my big brush. Yeah. A lot of his very first paintings are done with watercolor because that's what he had when he was out on the range, as you might say. Right? It's not like he had access to he was he was a working cowboy. So it's not like he was had an easel and all that kind of stuff at first. Um so this painting might have, actually well I don't at this point he's definitely not a cowboy anymore um, but uh, it is possible that it could be both watercolor and a little bit of uh, paint over top of it or like oil paint anyway so there's all this kind of stuff with like the rains under there. Okay, cool. Again, I think I'm going to brighten that up. I'll do another um, mix of that color shortly here. 
Uh, but maybe, you know, while we're right here, let's do the same thing with the bottom of the painting, right? We mixed this uh, warm... Um, actually, let's move this down here. Mix this warm brown. Now, I think that's going to be a little bit too dark. So we'll do the same thing. We're going to add some white to that color. We're going to tint it. Pretty close. Oops, I got my arm in here. So, you know, what? I'm just going to paint this right across here, and then we can fine tune things. Maybe should have made a little bit more of this. And again, this is maybe I should have had a little bit more white in there, Michael. too much white in there so let's just put a bit more yellow warm yellow in here turn it a bit more of a brown again I wasn't planning on painting the painting this way, but uh, I think I got kind of excited about finally being able to show the difference, you know, warm and cool brown. So take a bit of a tangent, but uh, we'll get to the same place by the end here. I think it's also just like kind of nice to see these colors side by side like that. Um, okay. So again, you know, if I look at the painting like this, I'm like, ah, oh, looks great. I'm really happy with it. And then I look at it side by side, I'm like, ah, oh, the colors are all wrong. But you know, um, It always sort of depends on what you think of, like what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, etc. Um, I think it's, for me, I would have liked to have seen a professional artist kind of go through some of these, this aspect of the painting process. Often, when when I see videos of so-called experts painting all you see is the the clip where they get it absolutely perfect right off the bat right and you're just like wow i guess it's, you just there's some people out there who are just perfect all the time 
right? It's like, and, and so then if you're trying to kind of follow along, you're like, wow, I can't get it perfect. I guess I just must be really bad, right? And then you understand, like, I think when you just like, see this, it's like, ah, you know, I don't get it perfect every time. In fact, very f few times do I get absolutely perfect. Um, but it's also not the end of the world because I can also kind of show you <laughs> how I can kind of either just live with it or how I can fix it, right? So I'm going to blow dry this and I'm just thinking to myself right now, do I need to alter the background, the sky? I did, I really liked what is there. I think I might do the sky just because it's a little bit... Uh, there's some patchiness here and so adding a bit of a slightly modified adding a little bit more paint here will just clean that up a little bit but down here I think I might be fine with the ground So it's also interesting. You probably, if we did a time lapse of that, you you would be able to see how the colors down here changed a lot, right? As it started to dry, it started to kind of lighten up. Often, acrylic paint, when it's wet, it looks darker than it ends up actually being when it dries. Like you could see here, where there's what we call like the mass tone, where you have a, a kind of a thicker area of paint right here. It looks darker than this area. I suspect it's going to be it won't be quite as light as this this area when it dries fully but it will be it'll be lighter than that same thing here where there's some thicker areas of paint anyway um i'm just sitting here debating to myself whether i want to continue painting on the background i think let's move Let's 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 go down to the horse and start just kind of dialing things in a little bit. So we're gonna also make a, um, a a warm brown. Remember, we want our cool colors to be in the background and our warm colors to be in the foreground, right? So our foreground is really this patch of of ground right here, and then the subject, which is the the horse and the fellow riding the horse. Right? And then as we move a little bit further, this area in behind, which is, you know, where we have this, that big rock, I don't know if that's, uh, what is that, monument, what is the name of that, that, in, in, somewhere in the United States, I'm trying to remember what this is, there's a, a, a rock, famous rock formation, it's some, like, it's like Ayers Rock in Australia. It's, and it's been used in all sorts of westerns and stuff. Anyway, that area, in in terms of this painting, could be considered either part of the background or even maybe part of the middle ground. Um, if you want to think of three distinct spaces in this painting. So, uh, we definitely want our warmest colors to be right up here. And then on the horse and the figure... And then our coolest colors to be in the sky, or at least the, especially the sky back here, towards the horizon. And then everything else is kind of in play, depending on how much space we want to create. Okay, so let's we're gonna mix another warm brown because the one we we used for here has got a lot of white in it. 
And we don't want quite as much white um, in the horse here, right? Because uh, otherwise it's, the, the horse is just going to blend into the background. So... Um, I don't even really need to clean my brush. Well, actually, you know what? Let's, let's, we will. I was going to, there's quite a lot of white in there, so let's just wipe that off. Um, let's move that down. So let's mix our, our, another brown right here. We won't need quite so much of it. So let's get some of this. Warm yellow on our brush. Again, we're going to take some warm red. And a little bit of warm blue. Right, and then we can mix these together. So you see how I start? I get a little bit of color on, on the sides of the brush. And then I put them down here. And then I can kind of, as needed, pull a little bit more color onto my brush. So in this case, I'm going to use most of it, and I'm going to probably add a little bit more. But let's take a bit more red. Let's even take a bit more blue. So you can see I just kept on adding a little bit more of each color over and over and over again. What I'm trying to get is the is the brown that is in the majority of the horse here. What we would call the local color. And the local color is the color that if I was to say to you what color is the horse and you say brown, that's the particular brown that I want to get. It's the crayon that a little child would grab to color things in. The local color is the color that's as in its, I guess, pure state before it's been the value has been modified, before we've added white or gray or black to it. All right, so I'm going to take this brown that I just mixed and let's put it onto the horse. In fact, let's start zooming in here. Basically, I'm just painting the whole horse in. I'm painting over top of some of the the uh, you know, buckles and all that kind of stuff on this horse. I'm not even really getting too precise. All of that will come here shortly. Okay. 
Okay. Even, you know what, I can even do the saddle, because the saddle is this kind of brown leather. We'll just, you know, define it as we paint on it. painting for like 30 minutes and we've got a lot of the basics in place here so next um, I'm gonna let this dry for just a couple minutes and while that's dry, well you know what why don't we just I'm gonna take these brushes these big big brushes and clean them off Got all this paint everywhere. So before I put these these brushes, which got tons of paint into my water, I just wipe off all that excess paint. That way I don't have to change my water every 10 minutes. And you can see also, I barely use any water when I'm painting. I only really used it at the very, very beginning. I think that's the number one misconception beginner artists have with acrylic is they just want to add more water all the time. Okay. What should we do next? I think actually let's... Uh You know what? I think... I'm gonna take... I have some of this paint that I, I used for the... for the, the ground here. I'm just gonna go around and just kinda tighten things up just a little bit while I've got it. Doesn't hurt to use it. Um, okay. So what I again one of the thing the, the the process that I'm using is I'm going to work from the back to the foreground, and then I, I I get then at that point you're like halfway through you've got your 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 underpainting done, and then I go back to the background, finish the background, and then go back to the foreground, and finish the foreground, and then ideally the painting should be done by that point. So I'm looking at the painting now, and I'm thinking about like the colors I want to add here. So what we have here is a lot of different browns and grays in this body. I mean, we've got his his flesh tone here, and we can even think, you know what? I could probably use a little bit of the flesh tone. This down here is almost like a flesh tone, maybe with just a little bit more white added to it to make it a bit more of like a Caucasian flesh tone. But you know, you could turn this figure into whatever uh, race or gender. It could be a space alien if you wanted. So I just added a bit more white into the same color I had down here. Now I'm going to have to do a, maybe a little bit of outlining there, but... Uh, And then I look around. Is there anywhere else I could take the same color that I just have on my brush right now? Um, it's possible that we could do a little bit of detail on the horse itself. This color, maybe even the saddle. So 
just gonna brush a bit of that in. I'll do the, the whole horse separately. Okay, so next let's, we wanna make a bit of a gray. So, um, I'm just gonna clean that brush off. Put these in the water. So to make a gray, what we can do is we can use the color we've already got here. Um, in fact, let's make a, a warm gray zoom out here so um, maybe I'll preserve some of this here so in fact let's make a, a warm gray and we'll do it down here in the bottom so we can make a warm gray just we can as we can make a cool gray I'm gonna take some warm yellow good heaping of cold or sorry warm blue warm red and it's like we're making a, a brown here now obviously if we add a lot of blue to it look how we get this really dark um, dark brown and maybe I'll even keep a bit of this to the side that I can use for uh, darkening that brown but we've got now this kind of really it's basically a very dark brown, kind of a muddy brown. You can see I can add a little more red to it to kind of give it a bit more um, warmth, more warm red. But we want to make a gray. So let's take a bit of cold red, or cold blue, and a bit of cold red in here. And we mix this together. Now we got colors all crisscrossing around the color wheel. In fact, even let's take a bit of cold yellow and put this in here. You're like, ah, I don't know, it just looks like a big blob. Really, we're getting close to one of the darkest colors that we can mix. If we want it even darker, I just keep on adding some blue to it. But let's just now just take this and let's mix it off to the side here. So we're taking some white mix it here and look we've got a gray and I'm gonna put a little bit of wait. so what we have we right now we've got a um, a warm gray right it's got a it's there is some cool colors in there but predominantly it's cool it's warm because we have a lot more of our warmer colors in it. If we wanted to do the cool version, we would just make it predominantly our cold colors, which is a little bit of warm colors in there. But this is going to work well for the character riding the horse in the foreground, as well as we can use this color elsewhere. And I've also added a little bit of white next to it that I can use to brighten that color, or, or I guess, or, or lighten the color, tint it, um, it wouldn't bright it, wouldn't brighten the color because that would be bright tends to be more of like an intensity thing which is, means we'd actually get more yellow back into it but I'm getting all into my terms today okay so let's put this up here So let's just take the color we just mixed right out of the tube and we can kind of paint it on the front of his body here. Okay. 
Okay. Now I'm just going to add a little bit of white to that same color. Maybe a lot more white. I'm just going to paint a bit over top of this color that I just put down here. exactly sure what some of this is so I'll just paint it in and we'll see I don't know all the specifics of like the all the buckles and everything on uh, that he's he's wearing I'm, I'm happy with everything so far. I know it's a little, we've lost a little bit of the, the pencil lines under there. I'm, I'm quite confident as it dries, we'll see a bit more of that as we go. Oops, sorry. It's probably loud clinking against the microphone, isn't it? Um, okay. Hmm. I'm going to take his, this brown, the same brown I used for the horse, and I'm just going to paint in his, um, what do you call this, his belt, where he's got his um, weapon attached to it, his handgun, and we'll fine tune all of that shortly here. Okay. I wonder if I want to do much more to the painting at this stage. Um, So now I'm just thinking, should I do I want to go into this background? I think I am going to lighten the background up a little bit. So I've got this color that I had here before. So I'm going to add more yellow to it and maybe a bit more white. And we'll see what's uh, how that that works. And if we don't like it, we don't got to keep it, right? So here's this color. Here's the paint that was there before. Need a bit more. It's kind of bluish. I want a bit more red in there. Warm it up a bit more. Hmm. Not quite different enough. Let's get some more yellow in there. I actually kind of like this color a lot, so I'm going to use it. I'm just going to take a smaller brush just to get in a little tighter. 
So once I'm done this, I, I will just leave the background alone. Ideally, hopefully, I won't need to do any work in there afterwards. Because I've got a lot of paint in place. Sorry, I hope my head wasn't in blocking everything. <laughs> Sometimes I look up and I'm like, oh, I'm basically, you just see the top of my head for however long I was on looking, looming over top of the canvas. Yeah, definitely different color than he had in, in his. But if you know anything about me, it's that doesn't really matter. I just want to get about as close as as I can and then I just I walk away. As should you. I strongly believe that. Okay, I just want to... There's a little bit, uh, because I was fiddling with that smaller brush in here, so I'm just taking my bigger brush. And at this point, like, if in doubt, I'm painting over top of the body of the, the cowboy and the horse. and the ground too because I'm going to paint stuff over I can paint over top of it and make it look nice and clean and sharp okay it's an interesting color like it's got a to me that actually has a I like that color better than his but I could see why some people would would prefer his over my color It's also, one thing it's, it always gets me is the color looks different here with, in, with my own eyes and it looks, I have a preview screen in front of me and then a computer screen over here. So basically I've got three different versions of each painting. Okay, so I'm just going to take a quick second now. So this would be, if I was going to call it quits for the day, this would be a great place to do that. Because I've got, um, I would say I'm, you know, maybe a third of the way finished. I've got all the, I've got the back of the sky done. You know, you could put clouds in there, or sunset, or space aliens, whatever you want to do there. But I, as far as I'm concerned... 
that's uh, I've got everything I, I want there I did drag my brush over the edge weirdly enough but I think it's okay um, I'm just going to turn my attention back towards the ground here. So, let me see. I think with this ground, I want a bit more of a peachy kind of quality in this brown. So I'm gonna take, uh, let's get some more warm yellow. Warm red. So the difference here is I'm kind of mixing in with the previous brown, but this one has got very little blue in it, so it's got a bit more of a peachier quality. This is going to make it really kind of pop. And let's go, I'm going to even go a smaller brush here. And I'm just going to push this in and around here. Remember, I said I want my warmest colors up front. It might be a little bit too warm for some people, but I like my, my colors a little bit more saturated, so. I don't really want to go too much further here. I kind of like this bit of more of a faded thing going on there, so I'm going to keep that. Okay. <laughs> so, again, perfect, perfect place. This would even be a better place to end for the day if you were going to, if you had to. I keep getting these, I don't know where these little things are coming from, probably from my hands. Um, but, you know, if you get those little things that fall off of your hands as you're painting, unlike what I keep doing and trying to pick them away while the paint is wet, you have to just, like, and I'm obviously not very good at it, you have to just take a breath, let it dry, and then when it's dry, they're, they just, it just blows away or falls off. If you pick at it, you get those kind of streaks and stuff in there. Okay. I think I'm just going to quickly blow dry all of this here.
Ai, ai, ai. Ah. Right off the bat, a drip of water right there. No, well, maybe it was fortuitous because I was thinking, ah, oh, you know, I want to touch up this, but uh, I don't want to get that paint wet. So sometimes those little drops of water you're not expecting <laughs> coming from the heavens are a sign that the painting just wants a little bit more in whatever area. I see uh, B, B a B gr says greetings from Amsterdam. Welcome B, B a B or B a B a B, B B. Welcome. And then uh, Ace says or Paula says welcome B. This is a great painting club. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Dolores says watercolor anyone i started and i guess i'll see how it goes as i said um that was definitely charlie russell's uh, preferred medium when he was out on the range when he was younger and then he graduated to oil paints as he got more experienced um I think it's what's just so cool is that he would be able to, he would have probably done today's painting in about an hour and a half, like literally just cranking these things out. Because, you know, one of the things, like, you know, when I'm doing this, I'm trying to be a detective, trying to kind of understand how the artist worked and kind of work backwards. If you're an artist who's painting the same kind of image over and over, you start to kind of, or not the, exactly the same image, and I don't mean that to, to degrade the work of him or any other artist who has kind of a similar kind of um, artwork that they're making, like similar motifs, similar themes, similar subject matter, is that you, you already know what colors you want and how to mix them very quickly. You know kind of how to draw those images, and you sort of get into a bit of a process and a routine. Like, each time, I'm almost like reinventing the wheel, looking at all these different artists. But, you know, if he knew, like, like he would, he could make, because he knew exactly what ingredient, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like the first time you, I often use cooking references. You know, the first time you've, you ever bake muffins or, or banana bread, right? You're looking at the, at the recipe, like... Oh, I've got oh a little bit too much salt and oh, a little bit too much. Oh, I gotta just even the cup off and oh, I gotta pour a little bit of water or milk or all. And you're getting like really, really precise. And then after you've done it, like you know, uh, after your tenth time doing it, you're you're just like scoop, throw it in there. And then after the one hundredth or the thousandth time doing it, you're just like you could be talking on your phone you're like crack an egg what's that I mean you're answering an email while you're doing right so you just sort of you don't part of that just becomes automatic right less kind of planning and thinking have to go into it okay blah 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 so I'm happy with my background I'm not going to touch the background the sky anymore uh, mine's a little bit more of a mustardy color than his I actually suspect he might have had a bit more warm yellow in his. Mine's a much cooler sky. And you can see it's 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 we have much stronger differences between this cool brown in the background and the warm brown in the foreground. 
right? Partly that's because I like kind of quite bright colors. I like more extreme contrast. It's just my style of painting. And it's also because I want, I, I was got really excited. I never, it didn't occur to me, but that we could do a comparison between warm and cool colors here. So this, the sky is a brown, but it's a cool brown. And one of the, the easiest way to tell is, doesn't it have a bit of, it looks a bit greenish, right? And that helps us identify whether it's, that it's a cooler color. Cool colors lean towards green and blue. Right, whereas our warm colors lean towards orange. So in this case, we've got a peachy warm brown up here. And then up here, we've got a greenish mustardy um, color in the sky. Okay, so what I wanna do, I think is, uh, let's do a little bit of the, the dull colors in the background here. These, the, the, the uh, dull blues and purples as we move back from the foreground into our middle ground and background. Okay, so let's start off. Um, I think we can use the same, let's mix it over here. Let's move this down. And actually, yeah, let's do this right here. So I'm gonna take my warm blue my cool red and I mix these together I'm gonna to get a purple All right then you're gonna mix two versions of it this one's gonna be primarily up a um, bluish purple and this one's gonna be primarily a reddish purple that way I can I don't have to continually be mixing these back. I can kind of keep them separate. So not only is this this brown is going to be, or sorry, this purple, this one is leaning a little bit towards the cooler side because we got more more magenta in it. And then this one's leaning towards much more of a warmer side because we got the warm blue in it. Okay. Now let's add, we're gonna need a lot of white for these colors, because they're, the white, uh, by tinting the color, we, we give the impression that the color has a lot of atmosphere in it. There's a distance between what that original color would have been and what it, how it appears to us, that there's light, uh, or sorry, like molecules of, of water and stuff, dust in this air. So if anything, that might still be, like if we, let's just turn the palette here. Right, see how it still looks? Maybe still too dark. And it's actually, still we need a bit more blue in it anyway. Okay, I'm just wiping the paint off of my brush, and then we'll go back into this. All right. So I'm going to use this for some of the foreground stuff, and then as we go, I'm going to add more and more white to it. So now I'm just going to transition to a much smaller brush. So now we're, we're just going to start refining this painting and start getting, um, dialing into the details. Okay. So. Putting in these big fluffy bushes. Let's 
get to this shadow. The shadow is going to be darker. I've lost my pencil lines here, but it's not, it doesn't bother me. Oops, a little bit too much white. Here. So if I've lost my shadow, I just think, okay, it looks like the light is almost coming straight down on top of this figure. So I want to try to line up these legs. We're gonna darken all of this in case you're like getting all worried, but I just I'm gonna start here with some lighter colors and start catching some of the light. And then I'm just going to now take a bit more white in the same color. Let's just kind of go a little bit further back. Take this same color. I wasn't intending on doing just this right in here, but I like this kind of bluish, warm bluish color, so I'm gonna just gonna put it in here right now as this cloud of dust being kicked up by the horse. Okay, so this is too bright. It's too, um, I need a bit of gray in that color. So I'm mixing some of that gray that I had earlier, mixing into this color. And I'm even going to take a bit of that same color we had for the foreground. I'm going to add it in here.
And then I'm just kind of blending a bit of that into my middle ground area here just to, so we don't have quite such a hard, abrupt stop between the, these two different, you know, the warm color and the f really kind of bright, intense warm color in the foreground. Again, it, but it is important to to know that, you know, because I, I could see some people painting, being at this, and they're just like, oh, what a disaster. It's always important to remember, like, it's hard to, when you're, when you're starting to paint, to be able to, to keep in mind that you're, you're seeing the painting half finished, right? In the same way, when you, if you were to, uh, if you're cooking a steak on the barbecue and it's raw and you put it on there and you take a bite after one minute on the, and you're like, oh gosh, it's just gross. It's, it's like still bleeding and, oh, uh, well, maybe some people would like that, but you, you have to be like, oh, well, I'm, of course it's not the way I like it because it's, it's just, it's not finished cooking, right? It's, it's, I don't really know how to describe that experience, but um, you just always have to kind of rem see the bigger picture. I think that the only way to kind of understand that is just by doing a lot of painting. And then you start to get a sense of perspective and understanding where you are in, 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 the, uh, in the, the, the process. So, okay. I like where we are. What should we do next here? I think I want to. Con uh, what I'd like to do is, I think I want to get pretty close to finishing. The uh, that would be great is I could finish all of this down here, and then we'll just focus. Let's say the last hour on the figure. So, what else should we do immediately right here? Uh, we're going to do a bit of glazing. I think will be really helpful to kind of nail in some of these other things. So, um, one thing I see is a bit of, uh, w let's mix a bit of some cooler color. Let's add, mix a bit of cool blue into this purple. So I'm going to take this cool blue, put it right here. Let's take a bit of our white. I'll put that right here. Okay. 
And then... Giving these little pops of cold blue. In the foreground, just because that use, is using a bit of this color, it's really kind of nice. So, I'm going to include a bit of that. And then we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to take this cool blue. We've got our gray that we had before. And I think now what I'm going to do is do a bit of glazing. Take that glazing fluid and this cool blue. I could have really started glazing a little bit earlier, quite frankly, but um, A bit of this color right here in the foreground. It's a little bit unusual, but uh, let's see if there's some wisdom in that. Okay. Even a bit. Okay, so I'm going to keep that. Uh, actually, let's blow dry all of this before I do any more glazing over top of anything.
Okay, so I'm gonna take this uh, this purple, it's more magenta-ish purple. Let's we're gonna mix it into the same color here. Oops, it's a little bit too dark. Yeah, and then just start kind of adding these little um, darker areas, which just suggests maybe a little bit more clumps of these patches of uh, bushes or whatever they are. I feel like that's pretty nice so far. We've got a pretty good sense of depth moving into this painting. We'll come, we'll do some of this stuff, all these little rocks and things. I think that's going to be much darker uh, colors than anything we've used here so far because that's really going to pull it towards us. So we'll save that. I think as we start painting in the horse, I think we'll say we'll do that. Okay, pretty good, I think. I'm pretty happy. Um, in fact, there's not... Maybe, I'm, let's see, let's do the, the kind of cloud of... of uh, dust that's spitting up into the air here. Let's do that next. So let's just take a bit of white. We're going to take a bit of glazing fluid. Mostly glazing fluid, a little bit of that white on there. We'll see how the white does. I think we're probably going to add um, I was going to say I was add a little bit more color into it, but let's just see how this works at first. Let's zoom in here. I'm trying to do these kind of just swirling lines here. I 
I suspect I'm going to do another layer of this and then kind of spread it out a little bit more. But I think I might do that after I do a little bit more on this uh, horse here. Oh! That was kind of scared me for a second there. <laughs> the light's going on and off. Okay. So we'll let that dry. Let's see if there's anything else here where we can use. A bit of this white. You know what? I'm, I think I might leave that like that for right now. Okay. So I think we'll, let's let's move on to the horse. Uh, or yeah, we can probably do that. We'll just uh, let all of this dry. So we've got our brown that we've made before. We're gonna, gonna dip into that. Um, now I don't know much about horse anatomy, and it's interesting when I did this uh, collaboration with the Stampede gosh, almost ten years ago now. Um, you know, I, I had all these meetings with, with, with these various different officials in the Stampede, and a lot of them are cowboys. Um, it's interesting, like, Calgary is a cosmopolitan city, uh, in Alberta, which is, you know, it's uh, about two, uh, three hours drive from the American border, um, and right near the Rocky Mountains, and... Calgary, you know, is this, you know, it's it's a city of almost a million people now, and yet it's surrounded by all of these ranches. A lot of the the beef that comes from Canada is comes from Alberta, from all around Calgary. Um, uh, so a lot, a lot of farming, uh, a lot of, like, most of the mustard, speaking of this mustardy color background, comes from Calgary. Uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, like something like 90% of the world's mustard, uh, the mustard seed anyway, is it comes, the raw mustard seed comes from uh, central Canada. And so we think of like the stampede as this very artificial thing, or at least I used to before I, I was invited to participate with the stampede, as this very artificial, ridiculous thing. And then you realize that there is this whole circuit of um, in small towns throughout uh, Alberta, um, British Columbia, a bit of Saskatchewan, then Montana, Idaho, Utah, and people do these circuits of chuck wagons, uh, horseback riding, uh, barrel racing. Um, they do auctions for cattle and horses and all that kind of stuff. And all that stuff happens in these rural communities. And then they sort of, it's almost like these rural communities take over Calgary for 10 days. Um, and uh, I don't know where I was going with that. But I just I just thought it was like super fascinating. It gave me very different experience, different take on uh, the, on, on what the stampede means to, 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 to people. Okay. So... Oh, so anyway, I was sitting on these juries where we were talking about, because uh, I was invited to jury that they have this art auction, and there's all these like cowboys who are sitting there and they're looking at all these paintings of horses and stuff that have been submitted, and they're like, ah, the, uh, whatever, the anatomy on this part is all wrong, they don't know how to draw a horse, and I just came away thinking like, that's pretty silly. Like, it's a really cool painting. Yeah, maybe the, the hind legs of the horse are a little bit funky, but... Uh, like, what does that really matter in the grand scheme of things? I think I'm going to add a little bit more. And... 
after as you know over the years I've come to kind of like you know if you're gonna if you were really into horses and you're thinking about putting something on your wall it would drive you nuts if the actual image had a was just looked funny had a it's the anatomy was off right so of course you're gonna be a little bit more obsessed with getting that kind of stuff right Now there's something kind of funky going on down here. That leg is going to need a little bit of work, but I should also say, you know, I'm a vegetarian, and I, uh, I'm a big animal lover, and I know that there's, you know, the Vancouver SPCA, you know, as protests and condemns the Calgary Stampede. Um, the Calgary SPCA, I don't know what their stance on the Stampede is, but it is interesting that there is a, a there's a, a, there's a, a vocal number of people who are very um, who take a very aggressive stance against the stampede and, and believe that the stampede is um, perpetuating violence and un unnecessary duress to various different animals through some of the activities and I know that when I was younger um that was one of the reasons why I did not like the Stampede. I felt that it was, it was like, you know, these animals that are being used for chuck wagon races and everything, and they break their legs and they have to be put down, and like, uh, it just seemed like unnecessarily, like putting these animals in danger, etc. And... I've, I've since kind of my opinion, especially having spent time with, with real cowboys, uh, has definitely been changed. Um, talking to them about, like we, you know, when you're riding around on a saddle with somebody for a few days, you get pretty comfortable and you start asking them about uh, these things and... I think they, I think they're, they're actually quite offended by by that, that the insinuation that they don't care about the their animals. Um, like, they talked about how you know this is their livelihood. You know, like whether you agree with it or not, like the, the, their livelihood. These men and women who ride these horses. You know, they depend on these horses to be healthy. And they're not all very wealthy people. And if the horse falls and breaks its leg because of, through a race or whatever, it can, like, basically bankrupt a family. And, uh, you know, it can really alter the course of a whole family's uh, fortunes. If they win, obviously they, they can make some money. But if things go very badly, um, it can go very, very badly. And I thought that was really kind of an interesting thing that I, I picked up from that experience. Is, and so they would say, like, you know, why would I... If, if this... You know, the last thing I wanted, you know, I've been, I've raised these animals since I was a kid, 
and I, I I care for them more. They would say like I care for them more than I my own kids. You know, they're they're precious to me. And yeah, some, sometimes they get hurt, and sometimes they have to be put down. But you know, they'd say I cry. The only time I've ever cried was when I had to put my horse down. Right? Like uh, I got I've been divorced three times. And I've got six kids. I've never. The only time I've ever cried is when I when we had to put my horse down, right? And I don't know. I I just that all of that really surprised me, right? I just expected them to to see these animals as just interchangeable things, and if one had to be put down, it was it was you know whatever. Who cares? But. Because I think that's, yeah, I think that's how a lot of people see that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, they they took it very seriously, the the injuries to their animals. And it was not, uh, it was not a joke or something they took lightly. Anyway, speaking of, like, anatomy on these, there's something kind of funky going on here. I, I'll dial into the, these legs a little bit. Um, but I'm, I'm right now. I'm just now starting to darken some places. I've left a few places, basically bare, because that's maybe where some of the highlights are going to be. I can put that highlight back in later, but it's always, I think, desirable. If I can leave it like that, then it, it's it'll look different than when if I put white into that same color. Okay. And actually, you know what? Before I go too much further, let's do some of these rocks and things in the foreground. Well, I've got the same brown. So. See the economy that of of mark making that he's got here. Just these little tiny. I mean, it reminds me a lot of impressionism, where we're just putting these little specks down, and yet from further away, we're like, oh yeah, that's, of course it's just some rocks, and there's a shadow to a bush, etc. There's little things like this kind of drives me crazy when it when I've created something that, that starts to look like a line or anything like that. So I want to either paint it out or interrupt it in some way so I don't have that line continuing through.
I'll d darken some of this later, I think. As glazes. But I will put some specks of things. These are rocks and things are getting kicked up into the air. Didn't put a bush there where he's got, he's actually, it's interesting, he's got a lot of detail right there. I didn't put that there in mind. Okay, let's keep this train rolling. Let's darken this color here. We had a darker brown that we mixed, which is just warm red, warm blue, and warm yellow. I could just continue taking that color and adding more blue to it. Um, but I'm just gonna take this here. And Okay. So I could do some of this as glazes. I just have a, a lot of... I think if I do that, it might... I just need to build up a little bit more of this, and then I can do a darker glaze on things. Okay, we're starting to kind of get into the details here, finally. I was a little confused as to what this tail is doing. See, again, I don't know if this tail kind of went between its legs when it leaped into the air. I don't... That's a little confusing to me. As someone who knows very little about horse anatomy. Like, my instinct is I want to have this tail coming right up off of here. But, since he's the master, I am going to... Follow his lead here.
Les tunes in here and says, I'm late joining in and going back to the beginning. I'll catch up with you guys. Good. Nice to see you, Les. Um, I'm excited to see what you make today, if uh, your version of today is painting. Okay. So this is, I like, again, the horse is not finished, but if we just look at where we are, we're, we're, we're you know, we there's most of the most important stuff is there. You know, we can now do some of the darkening and highlights as glazes later on, which is, I think, you know, when we're doing, getting into the subtlety here, I think that will be easier than trying to do it by mixing all these little colors. So let's move into the figure on the top. And then I, th and then I think we'll be, we'll be very close. Um, okay. So this figure, let's see, let's mix a, a, do we need to mix a gray or can we do this with glazes now that I'm looking at it? Um, I think, I think actually we could take some of this brown I'm going to mix some white into it. Gonna tidy up this body here, right? So this is just a gray that we had painted earlier, as a reminder. I am painting over some of the darker areas. I just want to make sure that I've got the all of the sleeves and everything in here. In fact, I'm just gonna paint over that buckle and we'll do that later. Basically, I'm just going around trying to get rid of any gaps where I see white or yellow from the original canvas below. Uh, I'm going to take our brown from you know, 20 minutes ago that we used inside here. Let's just take this brown. And maybe we'll zoom in even more. Okay, so we're fully zoomed in here. Now I'm not going to be able to get in all these little details.
In retrospect, this I probably should have made this whole painting a little bit bigger, but uh, you know, it's one of those things you don't think about. You'd think after doing almost a hundred of these, I would have thought about it, but. Uh, You get that. That's enough for the face. I mean, I, I, I'll probably do a little bit of glazing and darken some parts there, but I think that's about as good as I'll be able to get it, considering how small it is. So now I'm just taking some magenta, red magenta. It's my cool yellow. For the scarf. It kind of looks like a woman with a big dress on, right? So we're going to have to tighten some of this up here. So let's work on this belt for a second. see how you know because I didn't sand this painting down pre before this class which is what I should have done and I usually do it does make it a bit trickier to get into some of these details so to that brown. I mean, like, you could see how tiny these details are, and that's my finger. So, for some people, this is, like, just a bridge too far, a little bit too much detail. So you could do as much as, as you can, and then you just, 
You don't have to make it perfect, right? So I'm taking these little dabs to start representing this kind of fur on here. So my brush is almost dry. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to glaze. Now I'm going to take some, where's my glazing, there it is. Glazing fluid. A little bit there. This is my dark color, right? And this is all dry up here. So I'm just adding some of that color so I've got like Three to one glazing fluid. This dark, um, dark grayish brown, and then now let's go into this arm. face a bit. So just mixed a little bit of blue into that glaze. Really should just let that dry for a second.
this is a bit of a just a time-consuming process of just getting some of this done. You just gotta take your time. Some of this is drying. Let's think about other places we can move on to. Uh, onto the horse, perhaps. says C is that is it just me or does it say C X there? And so we can obviously just keep on darkening, keep on darkening. I'm just going to keep moving forward, though. From here. Right, really, probably the darkest part of this horse will be right under here, sorry. Right, this leg, right here. And nailing that is going to really help uh, push the other leg forward. Ah! Oops, I got water dripping from above here. One second. Yikes, there's a bunch of it. Okay, <laughs> one second. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through this painting. It's, I think it's cool enough down here that it's cooling off in the house. So. Um, dark color with a little bit of warm blue in it is basically all I'm using these right now. With glaze, obviously.
some of that is like the harness on the horse. And there's a lot of little details on here, ain't there? One thing about horses is they're kind of their ankles are, are really thin. They really taper in and then they come back out with these hooves. So one of the things I haven't done the best of job here is really kind of getting The, these legs and the thickness here. So let's just try to get a bit of that. Hmm. That actually should be higher, shouldn't it? And then that will thin. Well, I don't know how concerned I am about getting the anatomy perfect here. Um, let's move. Well, should I finish off the face of this horse? Getting pretty close. You know, my internal debate is, do I want to add black to this painting or not? Okay, so maybe what I should do is I'm going to put a little bit of this uh, saddle on here. I'm taking a bit of purple. I'm going to mix it into my darker color a little bit. Let's add a bit of white into it. I think we're about the time where we want to start adding some of these reins in. So we got them all over the place, but we don't really have them on the painting just yet. So I think that'll be my next step in a second. I just want to...
Okay. Okay, I think um, I'm pretty happy with where we are. Let's just take a zoom out and just take a sip of tea and think about things, where we are and how, and just our time, etc. Whoa, all over the place. It's like it's Buck and Bronco. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty happy, like, I'm actually, now that I see it zoomed out a little bit more, because I've had my nose in this painting for the past hour or so, I feel a lot better about things. Um, I think where I want to spend time, we're going to put some of these ropes and stuff all over the place. Uh, and then glaze down here. It's it's really it. how much more time you want to put into it is it's kind of up to you. It looks like I my hand stuck to the canvas in a few places down there. So, oh, you know what? While I've got a darker kind of glaze, um, let's I take this glazing fluid into some of this darker paint that I had mixed up. To this shadow. I mean that darker glaze. What's funny about glazing sometimes is it it you can get kind of terrified. You're like, oh my goodness, it made something really dark really quickly, and then you paint that same glaze on something kind of light, and you're like, oh, I can barely see it. So so you know, it's it sometimes makes it'll make the dark things darker, and then if there's nothing there to darken, it'll just make it a little bit darker, but not quite as extreme as. Right, so I'm going in here. Darkening this big cloud.
So I'm adding this little, these little pops of darkness next to some of these rocks. We're going to add the highlights on them shortly. And then I'm just sort of going into the background here, adding a bit of little specks, little dots. So actually, while I'm right here, let's let's do a little bit of a white glaze. I think this is still some white that was here. Um, let's see. Let's take a bit of that yellow. Let's take a bit of white. So this is the the color we had for the ground. I'm just sort of taking it. And adding a bit of white to it. Look at all these little rocks. I think this is the first time I've ever painted <laughs> like a, a, a bucking bronco, I think. Or did I, I did actually, I did um, a guy doing barrel races. I did a couple chuck wagon paintings, my own version of them. I think they're on my website if you want to see them, how I interpreted that. Let's take a... Let's same color I've been doing down here. Let's zoom in again. That's interesting, he's got a bit of blue that he added into that color. A bit of, tiny bit of cold blue that he put in there. So let's just do a little bit of that. We'll follow his lead.
I'm not sure I'm super keen on that, but uh, Go more white. Yeah, I gotta go way more white. So I think, you know, once we've got these reins in, I, I would say we're probably a half an hour from being done, which should be plenty of time to finish everything off. Um, Some of this, because it's a glaze, it go, it's going on very white. And then later on, it's going to dry much more clear. That's one of those things that takes a little bit of getting used to when you're using glazes. You can already see it's starting to kind of fade a little bit where I painted it, it's starting to dry, so we'll let that happen. So I'm gonna I'm doing this before I do any of those ropes, because 
It'll be a major pain in the butt to try to to do any of this and then kind of paint around different ropes and such and mixed a bit of yellow into that white for this buckle. Alright, so just first kind of playing around with some of these colors now. Let's do a bit of we'll mix a bit of purple into this white. Man, that texture that this whatever he's this thing that he's done here is, is kind of quite nice. This uh, just what is this? Some kind of uh, lamb fur or sheep or something. So that's gonna take up some of my time trying to get that done. Okay. Actually, you know what? I'm going to take some of this white, mix it in with a bit of my brown from before. Let's see about making. stripes on that gun belt there to make it look like I don't know where there's the cartridges or whatever they are for the gun that go in there okay taking dark color and get the inside of this hat the hole where his head goes um,
Uh, okay. Let's get the red of on his saddle. Or I guess this is probably a blanket that goes underneath the saddle, right? Some of you are probably wondering what that was. Why I painted that. Well, here we are. Here, all that white is starting as it dries it's definitely fading out not quite as intense as it once was um, So let's just, you know, I'm interested. Just, I just want to check to see. Darn it. Okay, I just spilled some tea all over the table, all over a hard drive. triage on my studio. Just opened Apple Music, which I don't <laughs> What was I going to do? I was going to... So this, the original painting is 19.75 uh, by 28 inches. So basically 20 by 30 inches. So 20 by 30, give me, this is 9 by 12, so the original painting is 9 by 12, it, so this is one third the size of the original. So that's, it. you know, if you're wondering like why it's hard to get some of those details that he has in his painting, don't be too hard on yourself, there's only so much you can do when you're when you've got um, a painting, you know we're we're working one third scale really. Um, okay. So what should we do? We're almost done. So I guess I'm thinking about the we just have the ropes and I'm I'll probably do a little bit more stuff here in the foreground with this. Uh, so let's take some glazing fluid. Here, let's zoom out a bit. 
I'm gonna put some glazing fluid here. Here's my white. Let's mix it into a bit of the glazing fluid. There's a few different colors on that white, which I like. Sort of blending it out a bit. I want to. I want to cover up these feet a little bit more. Gives it a bit more of that drama of the just leaping into the air. I feel good about that. Okay. I think now I'm going to oh, a couple of great questions there, Joshua. <laughs> uh, Joshua asks, uh, I'm a little late, but is there any tips for drawing while in a museum? It's a tiny bit hard due to the people looking at the paintings, and I don't want to be rude. I have drawn a Picasso guitarist in front of the Picasso guitarist, and people were swarming in like most on six people, and I was sketching in the crowd. Um... Great question. Okay, let me. I, I want to. Let's. I'm gonna paint uh, the 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 reins and all these uh, the ropes and stuff now, and then and while I'm doing that, I'll I'll answer your question because I've done a lot of drawing and I when I when I'm teaching in person, that's one of the things that we do as a class is we try to go out into public as often as possible, so that students have an experience of drawing in public because. That is often the thing that is most terrifying <laughs> for um, for artists. So let me just uh, uh, let's get some these ropes. Let's see what color do we want to do. I think I'm just going to use this this dark rather than mixing any more paint. He's his ropes are a little bit lighter, but I'm just going to use this darker paint because that's what I have. I could use mix it a little bit lighter of a brown. Maybe as I go, I'll just add a little bit more yellow into it, but uh, anyway. Um, I'm going to use one of my smallest brushes for this. If you want, actually, uh, you may find it helpful just to draw some of these lines out with a pencil very delicately. So, oops.
that loop wasn't theirs, but now it is. <laughs> um, So I'm thinking, like, where does this... Let's build this out a little bit here. Some of this will glaze and make it a little bit darker, or and a little bit lighter, depending, right? So some of these lines are a little bit thicker than maybe I would have liked, but I always start small and then thicken them afterwards. Obviously, I'm taking a little bit of liberties here. Uh, I'm going to take mix a bit of cool red in here just to have a slightly different cool red and even some of my warm red. That just cancels them out, so it turns it back into a brown, so
Okay. And then getting close to the end here. So let's get to this. Uh, I think it's like a whip he's got in his hand there. So actually, I'm going to rotate this canvas around. Actually, let me just take a second to think we want this to come up in here. Eh? down and all around take a look I mean I might be I don't necessarily need to this, these lines don't have to be all super thick I'd be happy with just that pretty happy with where we are right here obviously some of the colors are not entirely to my liking oops hey yay okay got a new I got new clamps today so that won't have to move Oop. why am I doing that I want to go this way. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just take a moment to think if I want to do anything more to this painting, this stage, or at all. There was his signature, which is kind of a cool signature. I might attempt that and then call it a day. I am... Uh, there's a little... <laughs> Obviously, I went a little bit wild with quite bright blues here. And pretty in intense. This orange is nowhere near as bright on in life as it is on screen. But it is interesting, you know, you put blue right next to orange, and it's going to make both of those colors look brighter than they actually are. So, um, I do want to do just a couple of little things here. One of which, I'm going to mix a bit of that skin tone again, taking some warm red. Warm yellow, let's need more of that. And a tiny bit of warm blue. Let's take there's some white here. So making this Caucasian skin tone again. And I'm just gonna put that back on his hands.
I put a bit of it on the horse as well. Take away a little bit of that white that was maybe a bit too intense. Um, can I live with these bushes being so blue? I think I'm going to want to glaze over that a bit. So let's take our glaze with our brown. Just cutting some of the cartoony blue that was in these. Just cut that down just a bit. See, not nearly as as kind of wild as it once was just 30 seconds ago, right? And I didn't have to pay, mix a new blue or do anything like that on there. Um, I do feel like I want a little bit more color. Oops. a bit of magenta into this shadow. It's interesting. He put he's got a little bit of white glaze coming forward here. I don't know about if I, hmm, I guess, you know, I should, let's, let's uh, I'm going to follow in his footsteps. We'll see what, how that affects things. So we've got this, our glaze here. I think we've got some white in here in this glaze. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go ahead and just jump two feet in here and go a little bit I need a bit more white. That's interesting. You know, it, it is having a, a pretty good effect. I'm going to have to darken some of these stones that I've just glazed over top of. But that actually, I think that, that actually, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did that because there's just too much orangey stuff right there in the horizon, right in the foreground. Would not normally have thought that was a good idea, but it kind of works. Putting a bit of white back into the shadow. And which is another thing that he did as well. Okay, so let's 
get this dark color again. Okay. I don't know if anything else needs to be done on there, right? Should I do the signature? It is, you know, I was going to say, it is his signature. Um, I think I, I should just uh, walk away and join my family for dinner. So I'm going to sign this and I'll answer, fi finish by answering your question there. Um, so, my name, last time I checked, is still the same. This is where I, I got the painting, anyway, by the way. Uh, what does it say? This version of a favorite Russell subject, a bucking horse and rider, oops, has a serene and timeless quality about it. It was painted as a thank you gift for Sir Henry Pilat in recognition of his extraordinary patronage at the Calgary Stampede. All right. Um, so, you know, this, this painting is directly connected to the Calgary Stampede. It was a gift to one of the persons that probably bought a bunch of his work at the Stampede itself when he was there. This is a great book. It really kind of shows... There's this one, and there's another one. It's Charlie Russell and the Victory Stampede. So as I said, uh, Charlie Russell participated in the 1912 Stampede, which is this one, and the 1919 Stampede, which is known as the Victory Stampede because it's related to the end of World War I. Um, 
and both of them were significant moments in in really the, both the Stampede and in Charlie Russell's career. Uh, I think this really helped him expand to a, a much larger audience, an international audience. Um, you know, really like this this kind of Western uh, iconography imagery is not only very popular with people in the United States and in Canada, but you'd be surprised at how many people in Europe and in Asia, um, sp even really specifically in um, in Germany, there's a huge, like, in, there's, a, there's a great documentary on the CBC about uh, people who reenact Western um, and indigenous uh, uh, traditions and clothing in Germany. I can't remember. There's like a whole, there's a theme park somewhere in Germany, Germany or Austria, uh, which is you know for somebody to dress up with an indigenous headdress, like a like a chief, is like a big no no here in North America. But they're still doing it in in Germany because. For them, they see it as like the most the the greatest sign of respect. Anyway, uh, but there's I can't remember what the name of that documentary is. It's a great. Uh, in fact, let's just since. Oh, oh. Um, uh, Germany, uh, Old West. Ah, ran out of my articles. Um, so Germany's fascination with the Old West. Uh, dressing up in the <laughs> cowboys and Indians is big in Germany. Where is it? And here's a Wikipedia page. There, there's an author, yeah, Lutz, that's right. This this author who wrote a bunch, or no, who's, there's a German author, Carl May, that's right. So this guy, Carl May, uh, traveled to Canada and the United States in the uh, late 1800s, wrote a bunch of fictional books about that, um, about the oh no he had never been there so that was that's what he, is even more ridiculous is he wrote all these fictional books about uh, the wild west and it took off like hugely popular in Germany and so they have these places where they do these reenactments there that is just bizarre what let's just take a quick little um, Um, and then we'll finish off here just in a couple of seconds. I just think it's, since we're talking about all of this, I know it's a bit of a tangent. I don't know why it's taking so long to load. I think this is it. Here. Searching for Winnetou. Great documentary. I don't know if you can watch this outside of Canada, but highly recommended. Searching for Winnetou. Um, anyway, let's uh, start to wrap up here. So Joshua just asked... Um, about drawing museums. I'm also headed to two museums in the span of two days in Dallas, and tomorrow I'm going to a museum that has a Michelangelo, Caravaggio, Cezanne, Munch, and Franz Halls, etc. I'm sort of overwhelmed by tomorrow due to the collection and also the paintings I want to sketch, especially the Edward Munch paintings I saw on the museum's website. So what I 
first of all, what I would say, it looks like you're... If you go to the museum planning on doing all of those drawings, uh, it's going to be a little overwhelming. Unless you just say to yourself, okay, I'm going to do a bunch of very fast sketches of each of these paintings. I'm going to do, you know, uh, six 10-minute sketches or six 15-minute sketches, and then I'll be good. I would suggest you do a, a couple that are longer, 30 minutes, do a 45-minute long drawing. Um, otherwise, you're just going to, you're not looking at them long enough. And you might as well just be drawing the images that are on the website. If you're going to be drawing from things that are there in person, you might as you should take advantage of the fact that you're there in person and really looking at them closely. And you may want to think about looking, making sketches of, of images that aren't on the website. So if you're going to spend an hour doing a sketch, think about something that you haven't seen on their website. Because otherwise, again, why are, why make that drawing in person? It's not the most comfortable thing to draw in person. Usually when I'm drawing, I have my sketchbook here. I like drawing with... Do I have any around here? Right, I like using sketchbooks like this. This is my favorite. When we did our, our how to draw class, this is the size of. Uh, I think we use the nine by twelve. I think they're the same size of the yeah, nine by twelve. I think there's, yeah, or is it eight, eight by, eight by? Tw I can't remember. Whatever it is. Anyway, this is the little bit larger size sketchbooks. This one is is fine, but what I like about this is how you can turn the page. Like, as you're sketching, you can just turn these and draw it like that. Otherwise, if you have a sketchbook that is like this, and you're trying to draw, and the pages keep flopping forward, it's a little bit ungainly. When I'm drawing in a museum, uh, I have my sketchbook, and I hold it like this. And you kind of and up against my chest or my belly really, so it can kind of rather than holding it out here, your this arm's gonna get sore very quickly. And I also find your grip gets really sore. So just sort of just let it rest in there, right? Your your hand is just supporting it, not gripping too tightly. The same thing with your hand. If you're drawing, your hand is gonna get really sore. So you're not uh, gripping the sketchbook or your pencil too hard. Um, you asked about like, you know feeling like maybe you're in the way of other people when they're trying to to look at the paintings so don't stand directly in front of the painting you know if I'm sketching something and let's just imagine the, the camera is the painting itself and right now I'm like you know another arm's length away to the lens of, of the camera is rather than standing right here and then everyone has to kind of come up and look over my shoulder and then they're looking right down over your shoulder at what you right is i would i often will kind of position myself off to the side so i'm drawing so what i, I might do is is start maybe and do a, a two minute quick sketch where i'm outlining the, the the composition so that I uh, because obviously if you're standing here on the side it's going to distort things a little bit right whereas if you're standing right in front of it and you can kind of get your your general position of whatever elements you need and then you can stand off to the side and it doesn't matter if you move or wherever you might have to stand further away or get closer you know, don't stand in front of the label where the label is, because that'll drive people crazy with it. They're trying to look, right? Um, and then don't worry if people are looking at your drawing. It's hard not... If you're standing there drawing a, a painting or, or an etching or whatever it is that you're, you're sketching from, people are going to have a natural curiosity to want to take a look at it and see what you're up to and, and how good or bad it is and sometimes people will make comments some people will go like wow that's really good or like hmm and it can be a little bit 
like you feel like you're you're putting yourself out there and people are going to make judgments people are going to make judgments no matter what and that's why i take my students we go outside we go and draw on public transit we go to some of the busiest places i can find in the city and start drawing often we take a model and the model fully clothed um in outside the school and we take the model and the model is sitting you know in a very busy part of town at a busy not an intersection but we go to like a public park um uh where else have we gone um here in vancouver M the school i teach at emily carr university used to be right down in the, the biggest tourist attraction on granville island and so we would go and draw right by the food fair and so there's thousands of people coming around and watching people draw and at first it causes a lot of anxiety and then after 20 minutes you start to kind of tune all those people out and just start focusing it on drawing again and you don't care so that would be my um and you just have to kind of get over it at first it's a yeah it's a bit scary and weird but if you're not in people's way then people get really excited and most people are very complimentary most people don't think that they can draw and they're very self-conscious about their own abilities so they when they see anybody doing anything they get really complimentary and are excited so that would be i hope that answers your questions so maybe do a little bit of research find out what artwork is already on the website or that you can find readily on google images and maybe think about not drawing those images and find some of the harder to find things that you're gonna that you can't take a photograph of maybe there's no photography in that part of the museum or on that image and that's the stuff i would make drawings of okay thank you everyone for following along with me today on in uh, on thursday we're going to be painting a carl rungus painting he's after uh charlie russell probably the second most famous western uh, artist he his focus is more on the wildlife aspect of the west so uh, we're going to be painting this gorgeous painting lake o'hara which is in british columbia uh, where he spent a great deal of time in bc and in alberta and i'm really excited to make that it's just the most beautiful blues and purples you've ever seen so uh Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. If you want to leave a donation via PayPal, there's a link down below. And I would be very grateful for any donations, large or small. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you know when the next videos are coming. And we will see you guys in a couple of days. So um, until then, if you're in Calgary, I think the Stampede is, is happening right now. I can't remember. Uh, go out maybe wear a mask even though you don't have to anymore just for everyone's safety i think that's a really good idea okay good night everybody we'll see you very soon <laughs>